In this video, I'm going to demystify a little bit more of the mysterious Fourier transform. In particular, I'm going to talk about the positive and negative frequencies, which sounds like weird terms, but you'll see it's not such a, not such a weird concept. And you will see why the amplitudes of a signal are split between the two sides of the Nyquist frequency. So they're split between the positive and the negative frequencies. And that's also going to lead to a discussion about how to visualize the spectrum. So if you would look at a power spectrum or an amplitude spectrum of a signal, in general, it doesn't just look like this. If you look at the full spectrum, you plot the entire output of the FFT, of the Fourier transform, it's actually going to look something like this, where you're gonna have some frequency structure that you expected here at you know lower frequencies or wherever you expect the frequencies to occur. And then when you get above the Nyquist frequency, so towards the right side of the spectrum, you're gonna have something that looks like a mirror image of the left side of the spectrum. In fact, it doesn't just look like a mirror image. It is literally a mirror image. What you see to the right of the Nyquist, so towards the right side of the Fourier spectrum, is exactly a mirror image of what's on the left side as, as long as the input signal, the signal you're taking the Fourier transform of, is real valued. If you're taking the Fourier transform of a complex valued signal, things get a little bit weirder, and I'm gonna talk about that in the future in the next section of this course. But mostly we take the Fourier transform of real valued signals, so you get a spectrum that looks like this. So we call the frequencies that go from zero to Nyquist, the positive frequencies, and in general, they get faster and faster. These sine waves in the Fourier transform are getting faster and faster as you get up to the Nyquist frequency. And then a funny thing happens when you get past the Nyquist frequency, and that is that the sine waves actually get slower and slower. And the reason why these sine waves get slower is because the sine waves themselves are spinning faster than how we can discretize them inside the Fourier transform when we are creating them. So the sine wave frequencies are starting to get so fast that we cannot fully reconstruct the rhythmicity of the sine wave. That is aliasing. That's what I talked about in the previous video. This concept of aliasing when, you're, when you don't have enough sample points per cycle. So what happens is these frequencies are kind of getting faster and faster, but they are aliased to look slower and slower. These are called the negative frequencies. They are the frequencies above the Nyquist frequency. And because they get aliased into slower frequencies, we actually don't number these as being faster above the Nyquist. We start counting these in hertz, going back down towards zero and attaching a negative sign to them. So for example, imagine that this peak here in the spectrum is 10 hertz and this is 20 hertz then this peak here would be minus 20 hertz, and this peak here would be minus 10 hertz. And then we get all the way down to here to minus one hertz. And now there's one key difference between the positive side of the spectrum and the negative side of the spectrum, and that is the zero frequency here. And the zero hertz frequency, the DC component, only exists on the left side. It only exists on the positive spectrum. And the reason why there is no corresponding negative zero frequency is because, well, it's because it's zero frequency. There's no sine to zero. Plus zero is the same thing as negative zero. There's only one zero. It doesn't have a positive part and a negative part. So we have one zero, and that's over here on the left. And everything else, all these other frequencies up to Nyquist get repeated over here to the right and we attach a negative sign to them. So these sine waves are getting faster, these are getting slower. Now in general, in practice, you don't uh, plot the negative frequencies. You ignore the negative frequencies in data visualization and instead you plot only the positive frequencies. And in fact, most people don't even plot all of the positive frequencies. They'll just plot some range up to you know whatever is reasonable. Let's say in your signal, it's only reasonable to expect energy at up to 100 hertz. But if you're sampling the data at 1000 hertz, 
the Nyquist frequency is 500 Hertz. So, you know, you might cut off your plot at 100 Hertz, even though technically you could go up to 500 Hertz. Okay, so this is just a little bit about visualization. So why do we have this negative frequency spectrum? And why is it a mirror? So it turns out that the amplitude of your signal is split evenly between the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies. So let's say in your true signal, there was 10, you know, let's, let's say this is some voltage data. So there's 10 microvolts in the true signal. There is 10 microvolts at 10 Hertz. So this value should be 10. However, when you look in the Fourier transform, the amplitude spectrum will only show five over here, and then it's gonna show the other five volts or microvolts over here. So why do the amplitudes for a real valued signal get split between the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies? The reason for that comes from defining a real valued cosine wave, so a real valued signal from complex exponentials. So remember in the Fourier transform, we are using complex sine waves, Euler's formula, complex sine waves, to represent all of the information in a real valued signal. So how can we get a real valued signal from complex valued numbers, complex valued sine waves? The answer is we have to follow this formula. So we need e to the i k plus e to the minus i k. And then we have this funny little division, this, this normalization factor of one half. So now replacing k for uh, the innards of a sine wave. So we have a time varying oscillatory signal. We have cosine of two pi ft. So this is a real valued signal here. And in order to reconstruct this, uh, or to represent this real valued signal using complex sine waves, we need e to the i and then 2 pi of t plus e to the minus i and 2 pi of t. So this part with the minus i turns out to correspond to the positive frequencies and this turns out to correspond to the negative frequencies. Now, where does this crazy looking math come from? How did I come up with these equations? This actually falls right out of Euler's formula, which I already introduced you to. So here we have e to the i k equals cosine k plus i sine k. Now, what would happen if I just add a minus sign in here? So you can think of it as replacing k with minus k. So now we have e to the minus i k equals cosine k minus, instead of plus, minus i sine k. So how do I derive this? Where does this come from? Well, cosine is an even function. And for an even function, minus k is the same. So the cosine of minus k is the same thing as the cosine of plus k. That's the definition of an even function. So for the cosine part, the minus sign doesn't matter. And then we get to sine, and a sine function is an odd function. And an odd function, or the definition of an odd function, is that the sine of minus k equals minus the sine of plus k. So we just take out this minus sign, here from minus k into minus times the sine of k. So this just falls right out of Euler's formula and the fact that cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function. Okay, so now what we're going to do is just add these two equations together. And if you like, you can pause the video and do this yourself, add these two equations together and see what you come up with. What you are going to come up with is that the sine terms cancel, the cosine terms double, and over here, you know, these two terms can't really just be, they're added together. We can't really simplify them much more. So we get these two terms equals two times cosine k. So this is where the factor of two comes from. So then we divide both sides by two, of course, and that gives us this factor of one half. Okay, so this slide explains why we have positive and negative frequencies, why the amplitudes are split between the positive and the negative frequencies. So we know from the Fourier transform, from uh, thinking about the Fourier transform as a loop, that we need n frequencies that go from zero all the way up to n. So we get n total frequencies out of the Fourier transform.
and half of them are the positive frequencies and half of them are the negative frequencies and then we have one extra because of the zero hertz component. And so this is the explanation for n over two plus one. We have n over two because half of the uh, spectrum is to the left of Nyquist, so the positive frequencies, and then the plus one because the zero hertz, we keep that on the uh, left side of the spectrum. So with the previous video and this video, you now understand how and why to convert from frequencies and in indices into frequencies in hertz. We have the lower bound, the upper bound, which is the Nyquist frequency, and n over two plus one corresponds to the positive frequencies that we are interested in. Now, I still haven't explained why we need exactly n frequencies in the Fourier transform. You could ask, why don't we just stop at n over two frequencies, stop the Fourier transform at the Nyquist? The reason why we need all n frequencies, including all the negative frequencies, is that we want the Fourier transform. We need to make sure that the Fourier transform is a perfect invertible transform without any information loss. We don't want to approximate a signal. We want to quantify it exactly in the frequency domain. That is going to be the topic for a later video. I think the title of that video is The Perfection of the Fourier Transform. So I'm going to justify that property in a little bit. But what I want to do now is mention two more things in this video. One is that although this is the correct formula for extracting the frequencies between uh, DC, between zero and Nyquist, what you will often see in code or sometimes see in code is people extracting the frequencies or converting the frequencies vector using a formula that looks like this. So from zero up to the sampling rate, not up to Nyquist, in n steps, not n over two plus one. Now, this is usually just a shortcut when people don't feel like writing out the divided by two uh, here and divided by two plus one. If you use this formula or if you see this formula, it's totally fine. You just have to keep in mind that these frequencies are going to be correct only up until the Nyquist frequency. Above the Nyquist frequency, this will no longer be valid. So this frequency all the way up here is not 990 hertz if your sampling rate is 1000 hertz. This frequency is not 990 hertz, it's actually minus 10 hertz. That doesn't come out from this formula. So this is like a coding trick, it's just a shorthand. As long as you are not interpreting the frequencies above Nyquist, then this formula is okay. And the final thing that I want to mention in this video is more about visualization, actually. I, I meant to say this earlier, but it slipped my mind. So here I'm showing the positive frequencies on the left, Nyquist in the center, and the negative frequencies on the right. This is the most common way to show it in many fields, like in biology, in signal processing, in engineering. I just want to briefly mention that sometimes in some disciplines, I think mostly in physics, they will show, they will basically move the negative frequencies to the left of the positive frequencies and have zero in the center. So you would see a spectrum that is mirrored at the center, not mirrored on both sides like this, with zero in the middle and the negative frequencies on the left and the positive frequencies on the right. Again, depending on what field you work in, you may or may not ever see a spectrum with zero in the middle, but you should just be aware that that is the case. Now, I mentioned earlier that the frequencies get split between positive and negative spectrum. So if you have a signal that actually has 10 microvolts here, you're only going to see five of those microvolts here and five of those microvolts here. But that's not really convenient. We want to be able to look at the Fourier spectrum and get an accurate assessment of what the actual units were, what the t real energy was in the signal. And to do that, you need to know about two scaling factors in the Fourier transform. And that is the topic for the next video.